all of those in the uh, in the room today, and also uh, the people online as well who who are joining this uh, presentation. Well, discussion, I should say, not presentation. Um, thank you for taking the time um, to, uh, to to come and listen to us today. Uh, it's going to be quite informal, and it's a it's a bit of a chat around uh, a number of subjects around health and safety, looking at the economic situation and the impact uh, in terms of health and safety and people's approaches. Um, people in the room, please feel free to ask questions. People online, um, due to my poor tech abilities, <laughs> being a lawyer, I think that's acceptable. <laughs> um, in terms of any questions, if there's anything you would like to discuss, um, please put it in the comments and uh, we will probably end up dealing with it um, afterwards, a bit of a follow up. Um, but um, like I say, anybody in the room, please please ask away. Um, so the the title for today is Health and Safety Strategy During an Economic da uh, Downturn, uh, Balancing Risks and Opportunities Whilst Looking After uh, the Workforce. Um, so those of you who don't know me, my name's Andrew Sanderson. I'm a, I'm a partner here at Phil Fisher. Um, I head up the health and safety team here um, and we we deal with a lot of uh, health and safety work, both proactively and reactively. Uh, so looking after clients before uh, they they need or or are investigated, and also looking after clients when they they face prosecutions. Um, I'm delighted to say I'm joined by um, two other uh, panelists today. Uh, on my left, uh, Sabah Nashbandi. Sabah, would you like to just say a little bit about yourself? Um, yeah, sure. So um, I am a barrister at Three Roman Buildings. I was called by 1996, I've been around for quite a long time. Um, and I specialise particularly in health and safety um, work. Um, I both prosecute and defend. So I am on the health and safety executives, a panel of prosecutors. Um, so I have experience of investigating corporates um, as well as defending. Thank you, Sabah. And then to my, to my right, I've got uh, Duncan Davies, who's the C, uh, CEO and co-founder of Notify Technologies. Duncan. Thank you, Andrew. And hello, everybody in, in here and, and online. Um, yeah, so Duncan Davies, um, CEO and co-founder of Notify, as Andrew says. Uh, I probably typify myself as a recovering accountant as well because I... I trained many years ago at PricewaterhouseCoopers, uh, then worked in a number of technology companies, so Sage, that people will be familiar with, accountancy software business up in the Northeast. Started Notify five, six years ago, very much a believer in the power that technology has to help make a change. Not that it's always the solution to problems, but that it can be a great tool. And we've seen technology help in many areas. And our observation a few years ago was that health and safety had been perhaps somewhat left behind in the technology revolution and that there was an opportunity to to help organizations corporates uh, not-for-profits charities we work with with quite a range of businesses to um, improve their, their safety culture and, and deliver real benefits to their, their business through automation and engagement thank you uh, thank you Duncan much much appreciated so uh, in in terms of today um, I've got a number of topics that we're going to um, we're going to look at and, and discuss and you're going to get very different viewpoints. Um, Duncan coming from, obviously, from, from the technology, uh, the solution, and uh, myself and Sabah coming uh, at it from, from the legal point of view, uh, although slightly slightly different um, viewpoints, bearing in mind, Sabah's usually the person that will present the case uh, in, in the courts, and, and I'm usually the one looking after the clients and doing the investigations. Um, so, so without further ado, let's let's start with the first uh, topic point that we've got. Um, so at the moment, um, we're obviously facing um, a challenging economic situation. Um, so in terms of um, health and safety challenges that companies face during economic uh, uh, economic downturns, how can companies best mitigate these challenges? I'm going to start with Duncan, I think, on that one. Thank you. Uh, good. Nice to get the first question in. Um, so I think th there's obviously a variety of, of things. I, I would say that in times of uncertainty, employees feel uncertain and therefore probably a lot of people are worried about their jobs um, and people will naturally therefore start to worry about is there a, is there a future? How, am I safe here? 
Um, there'll be, I suspect, organisations looking at things like training and, and do they keep training people to the extent that they used to be. So I think I think you've got that element of potentially people in an organisation losing some of their their skill set, worry, anxiety about what's coming up the road. I talk about VUCA with my my people in, in Notify regularly, so volatile and certain complex and ambiguous world that we now we now live in. And and that's part of this economic uncertainty, I think. Um, in, in terms of mitigating it, and we might come back to some of these things later on, because you know, I'm bound to say technology can help, I suspect. But I, I also think just leadership walking the walk, um, leadership being visible, um, reassuring people, um, engaging with their workforce, which is a low cost solution to making people feel like there's in the in the presence of this uncertainty, there's there's a, 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 a caring environment that they're that they're working in. So that would that would be a, a key part of the mitigation, I think. Sabah. So I, I think for me, um, the challenge for companies is about ensuring that even where there are as uncertain economic times and money might be tighter that health and safety still retains rightly an important focus within a corporate organization. So it is ensuring that it's not one of the first things whose budgets are cut um, for two principal reasons. First of all, it's right to do it. Um, and you know, most companies, I think certainly those I work with have a proactive and responsible approach to health and safety. But secondly, speaking as a lawyer, it is cheaper to be reactive, uh, to be proactive, as it were, as Andrew talked about, proactive and reactive, to be proactive and ensure you have proper, um, adequate health and safety systems in place. You are training your workforce and employees and you um, are monitoring and auditing that you have the appropriate systems in place. Then subsequently down the line, finding yourself in a situation where you do come to people like myself and Andrew, or you're at the other end of me prosecuting. Um, and the cost then is significantly potentially greater in terms of the costs of an investigation, litigation, potentially prosecution, and if successful, um, financial penalties, um, which for those of us who are involved in health and safety, and for those of you as corporates and all individuals involved with your businesses probably know, um, we work to a guideline now in sentencing and it you know, very much starts, um, financial penalties start essentially looking at um, your turnover and they can be significant and are increasingly significant. So for me, the challenge is um, to make sure that emphasis on health and safety um, doesn't fall down the line of, um, I guess, uh, where money needs to be spent uh, in times of economic change. I think, I think from our point of view, we, we get involved in at the investigation stage uh, if something's gone wrong. Um, and where there are economic challenges, I think what we see is that um, there are areas that are um, cuts um, so that might be in relation to training it might be in relation to uh, support for the workers um, and we often see uh, where there's been an incident and where we're carrying out an investigation there's been a cut to for example to health and safety training um, it's it's something that goes because the views taken well you know the the team have been trained that they're, they're fine. We haven't. They know what problems. they're doing. They know what they're doing. We haven't had any problems. Do we need to spend X amount this year? And 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 I'm not saying it's necessarily done for the wrong reasons. Although ultimately it has an impact on health and safety, but it's it, it's a, it's a cost cutting exercise, and we we often see that. And then trying to explain to a judge when you're presenting mitigation why the company cuts the budget for training is, is very difficult would be an understatement. Yeah and, and I think also as we know that um, in that sentencing process one of the factors that can aggravate a sentence um, that the judge, judge will look at is um, cost cutting uh, 
um, so profits, cost cutting expensive in, in order to generate profit. So it is, so whilst you may be able to say mitigation, well, this wasn't deliberately done. Um, we weren't cutting costs here deliberately to enhance our profits. That is the reality of what is being done. If there has been a conscious thought process about putting less money into health and safety, um, you know, and so I think that that could be a challenge. And it's it's unlikely the you know economic um, challenges are unlikely to form the basis of a uh, a valid sustainable defence, and they can be if presented in the proper way, appropriate way, they can be positive in mitigation. But I think when companies are looking at how can we spend this pot we've got most effectively and efficiently without um, at the expense, without it being at the expense of our health and safety, it's also about how do you document and explain that? So I think that is also important. And it's probably something that Duncan's very familiar with in his, you know, in the services he provides, a lot of health and safety. Um, when it comes to the likes of Andrew and I, we want to say, well, what, what did you do? And how, how can you show me that's what you did? And how did you make sure you were continuing to do that? So it's, it's all the due diligence. It's the, you know, it is the, the boring, potentially boring, but regularly required due diligence that, that needs to happen. Uh, and again, this is part of, I think, that documentation process. And I think linked to that, I think, is, um, you know, and I think it's really interesting, that whole what, what is defendable or not. So we cut costs because we need to be a sustainable business, but it, you put people at risk because you cut costs. There's also the bit of even just right-sizing the business. So text, text in the news every week now, technology companies are getting rid of, you know, a thousand people here and there. I wonder what the impact on the kind of corporate memory is. We talked about, you know, that people know what they're doing, but when you're taking people out of a business, you're taking out skills and experience and knowledge of how things work around here, which may not be captured in informal processes and actually which I think then increases your risk. Now it's hard to mitigate that in in that you need to take out headcount potentially. But as you do that, there's that risk that if you haven't captured what people do and how they do it and what they do it for, that you're ending up with these gaps in the organization where the the people that are left are both unclear on what they should be doing potentially and if you're not training them properly then they're not trained to do the job so you're kind of building up a risk just from what you might call right sizing in a sense i don't know if anyone in the room who sort of works you know in in industry and business has got any views in terms of what we've just what we just covered <laughs> i'm looking i'm looking at your looking in your direction <laughs> cutting in lights going <laughs> I know um, if somebody would like to get up and just move around over there they'll come back on <laughs> you're doing a sustainability thing don't you? I know there we go there we are you see <laughs> we're back we're brilliant back. <laughs> that was good time <laughs> that was good timing <laughs> hopefully they'll stay on there um so sort of I suppose um I suppose sort of following on from that um in terms of um, cost pressures that businesses are facing now, and um, and making sure that they um, that their health and safety strategies and policies and procedures are still effective, uh, and, and they're still managing those properly, what what would what would your views be in terms of that, and how businesses can go about doing that? Um, well, I think it's. Uh, largely back to if you're asking me first by the way but I'm, I'm jumping in but um, yeah um culture i think is is, is kind of number one we, we hear that that talked about an, an awful lot and i and i think you, you you hear it talked about so much that it sounds much easier 
than it really is. And I think you know, changing culture is is incredibly difficult. Um, I think, and I think that's what comes back to my earlier point about then your your leadership and the. And I was talking earlier with 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 Mike about that that doesn't cost a great deal. Having your your leadership team engaging on the ground with your people sends that right message of safety matters. Um, I, I think we have to recognise that there is always going to be a cost involved with maintaining health and safety adequately. And so I think, um, and it's very much dependent on the individual business in terms of where the money needs to be more effectively spent. So for some businesses, um, training is is training is important for all businesses in terms of health and safety compliance. But for some, training might be more important. Um, larger businesses will have, um, you know, there'll be different parts of the health and safety across the business that need to have different types, uh, type, type different attention. Um, for me, I find the larger the business the the larger the volume of documents the um, the more confusing they often can be and i just wonder if one of the things that can be done in a cost conscious cost restricted environment is for those within the business with the health and safety expertise to to spend that time to go back and say well let's let's review to picking up duncan's point in for reinforcing that message that we are a business for whom health and safety is paramount, our staff's health and safety and welfare and those who, who visit us is paramount. And, and really trying to look at how can we re-establish that, engage, to look at where are our gaps. So without necessarily having to spend lots of additional money, it's about looking to use the resources we've got within and the expertise within our businesses and perhaps use that more effectively yeah i mean one it's of, a difficult question it, it is it's, it's, it's not, because the health and you know complying with health your health and safety obligations ultimately costs money it it, it doesn't and one of the one of the things we we often come across is where you know as i was saying earlier there's been a bit of trimming in terms of maybe the training budget or maybe the review of policies the review of procedures and as Saba said at the start, getting being proactive about health and safety in, in its full context is a lot, it's a lot cheaper than if something goes wrong and you're then having to instruct um, somebody like me or somebody like Saba to then explain to a course what went wrong, why it went wrong, why it shouldn't, why it shouldn't have gone wrong and what we're trying to do to fix it. Um, I, it, it's it's very much. I appreciate you know sort of from an economic business point of view, you've got to do that. You've got to do that balancing exercise. But you know, being proactive is, is a is a lot better in so yeah. many ways. Yeah. I, I was just sorry. Just while it was in my head, I was just thinking. I, I gave a talk on health and safety a while ago, and um, again to a group such as yourselves, and uh, one of the sort of head of health and safety sent me an email afterwards and said I like coming to your talks you do this every couple of years for this organization and I like it because you tell us how horrible how the worst fines that there are <laughs> what that means is I go back to the board and I say this is how bad it can get and what you're actually doing is you're giving me the tools to go back and say um, let's think about you know it, it's not just about how we spend the money we've got effectively it's let's look at this in a way that is what if we don't do this what is the potential that can go wrong and that's if we're going to look at it in a purely commercial way it's what what might this potentially cost us compared to what could we put into it now and it's not just a commercial cost of course it's a reputational cost of an organization it's that attendant publicity that comes with protracted court hearings with cases that remain there on the internet forever and for which that corporate is long associated. So um, if you want me to tell you about lots of really horrible cases and horribly long, large fines, um, then, you know, we can spend a lot of time doing that. But, um, you know, but 
it, you know, we're all laughing about it, but actually there's a, there's a very real point to be made um, when some of you are directing that approach or you're on those boards or you're reporting to boards and you have to say, well, rather than buy all this equipment, um, can we spend some money? We need to we need to do this and spend this money as well. And you have a better opportunity of explaining and, and selling the health and safety to those that hold the purse strings. And I was that's exactly the point I was I was going to delve into as well, which might get a bit controversial, but there, there is a, an accountability for the safety director or leader in that yes. organization professionally yes. to fight the corner. So I think you know we, we well, talk about legally, potentially. Yeah, yeah. So we talk about what the company does, but you know, there's there's an element of a a safety leader recognizing that their job is to influence the board. So I, I, I you know, and there are two schools of thoughts, aren't there? There's the school of thoughts that goes, you go in there and you say to the CEO, you're the one going to prison. And and sometimes that lands really well because the CEOs, I don't want to go to prison. Um, and there are sometimes where that that's seen as scaremongering, you know. And and, I, and I've been in a finance role as a CFO in a large business, and you've got to get that balance right between. If we do this, we're going to run out of money in 12 weeks. Everyone goes, oh, my God, really? And then you quickly lose credibility because that's not the case versus not saying anything. And suddenly there's a there's a finance problem looming. And finance is, is, is a similar gig, right? It's compliance. You know, people don't like you turning up at their desk because it's boring. And you, you're, you're trying to comply with things that people might perceive get in the way of their jobs. So I think there's a real challenge for safety professionals in this environment to to step up and promote what the company needs to do but but influence and i think that's been that's often been a challenge when there are so many um priorities across a business you know we've got to sell some stuff and if you get in the way of my people selling stuff then there won't be a business is is a great argument from a sales director um and, and an operations director so it's 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 a key part of any organization and i think led by the ceo and the board is giving people the environment to influence and not shout down the safety person or that, oh, well, that's that's just doomsaying or something. I think that comes back to your point you made, I thought, rightly, Duncan, about it's all about culture, isn't it? And yes. it's the safety culture coming from the top. And we often see health and safety policies again and again will show have an organogram with, you know, CEO at the top, goes cascades down this way, this way, this person has responsibility for this and this and this. It's all very well having it in black and white, but it's actually, as you say, leading from the top and saying, this is what is important to us as an organisation. Um, and so it does, that message does cascade down and it is seen not as some additional unwanted burden that gets in where in the way of the day-to-day -day job but actually the starting point of that day-to-day -day job yeah i think one of i think one of the interesting things for us is that we often some of the clients that we deal with um it's it's you know the, the fines when things go wrong the fines the legal expenses the management time which doesn't often get added into the equation yeah. until after you know that that has an impact but one of our one of our clients sort of when they were prosecuted it the the realization was that a number of tenders that they go through the first or second question on the tender sheet was in the last two years has the company yeah. been prosecuted for um and you know any health and safety breaches and the answer to that when it's yes is you know don't don't bother filling in the rest of that tender <laughs> But it, but but they, for them that was that that was very you know that was a wake up call. It was, yeah. More, more so, I think, more so than the the fine to be mm. honest with you, and the reputational damage I think link with that as well, which we say. I don't know if anyone got any sort of thoughts in terms of that that we were just discussing. I think it's a difficult thing to, to broach because yes, you do need to put that washing out there. Uh, strange that when you're dealing with, with, with when you're dealing with clients who have got a record far longer than you about being prosecuted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to do yeah. as we say, not as we do. So, yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying that's right. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that's wrong. Yeah. Yeah. yeah.
I mean, also, can I add apologies for turning up late, by the way? I, I do apologise. No, welcome. Um, welcome. I've got a bit geographically uh, <laughs> or lost. Um, uh, but can I also say that even if you put no down as an answer and they don't declare it, it's obviously very visible now on the HC website in regards to prosecution to actually find out if they've been prosecuted as not, or as an individual, or as a business. You can't, you can't. You can't avoid you can't, it. Can't, it's and I believe that stays there for quite a period of time. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, no, abs absolutely, absolutely. That reputational side, you just can't, you can't get over it. I don't think. You know, um, m moving on a little bit, and this this is a this is a this is a subject that's really uh, important to me. I think I think a lot of the time when we talk about health and safety, uh, sometimes the health element of health and safety gets not necessarily forgotten about, but maybe dealt with, you know, at the end of the day or at the end of the week, and it, it's not always at the forefront it's not the same for every organization but you know it's certainly something we see so we've gone through we've gone through covid we're going through t tough economic times and, and this has a, a real impact on sort of mental health and uh, the health of, of workforces I, I don't know which one of you would like to deal with this first but you know what what do you think companies should be doing to making sure they're looking after their employees uh, in terms of health mental health um so sp speaking as a lawyer when andrew talks about that what i think about is again um i completely agree i think for all of us in all our organizations actually um looking after our own mental health and our employees mental health and those we work with is is really important and if you were to ask me, well, OK, but how might that translate into any potential proceedings or how might that affect? If we just look at it in a commercial way. How might that affect um, my business? Um, one of the things that I think that I certainly see, um, so aside from health and safety in the sort of <laughs> aspect, I do a lot of inquest work and I sit part time as a coroner, is we see, um, you know, people sadly, um, finding you know work so difficult and the pressures of work um, and other circumstances that they take their own life and or there are circumstances in which someone dies and what that what does that mean for you as a business and I think from a legal perspective it means that you could become part of an inquest process um, and again if we're looking at it purely from a reputational commercial perspective the potential implications of that um, if there were circumstances in the business where the business was not supportive of, of uh, an employee's mental health and well-being, particularly where it was known, then that might be something that um, a coroner subsequently issues what's known as a prevention of future death report. So it's a report issued by a coroner. It's a low threshold to the organisational person who can do something about it to say something has arisen in the course of this inquest. It doesn't even have to be directly related to that death. Um, and I'm asking you to take action to prevent it in the future. Those are public. We're going to talk about things on public records. They are public documents, stays on the Chief Coroner's website, as does the response, because you're required to respond within 56 days. So I think just looking at it from where how might this go then then that is for me something that i think it's important for businesses to recognize the starting point if we're not we're not speaking it from a legal perspective is um we should all be obviously looking after each other and supporting each other's mental health and again coming back to duncan's culture point it's really important that organizations are in a culture where employees feel that they are able to um express if they are um if they're going through periods of challenge and have the support there for them it's probably a different angle to what you might have been thinking of andrew when you put that question i don't know no i, the, I think where i was coming from and you're, you're absolutely 100 percent right we so a lot of we have a lot of clients in the construction um in the construction world and um a few years ago, we were approached by one of our clients who the number of near misses and the number of incidents that were happening on site was getting worrying for them. Um, and 
they they had good training in place, they had good policies, good procedures, and it was they couldn't quite get to the bottom of what was going on. And um, they, they they brought in occupational health teams, they brought in um, different types of teams, and we, we were working with them to help them with this. And the, traditionally, the construction industry has been uh, very male dominated, um, and that was part of the problem within this organization in that what they were finding was that the the male construction workers weren't looking after their health either their physical health or their mental health and what they were doing is they were you know they were away from home uh, working on site doing long hours um you know not not getting enough rest not having access to a GP because they're away from home, not have it, you know, letting knocks and injuries sort of go. And and it was then having an impact in terms of their working environment. So the client we were working with just sat down with with a proportion of their workforce and sort of said to them, look, what 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 would what can we do to help you? And so they introduced a um, they introduced a, an occupational health um, suite on site. They, it was quite a big site, but they introduced an occupational health suite on site. They had physio on site. They had um, access to a dentist, to a GP, and you know they the number of um, sort of near misses and the number of um, sort of knocks and scrapes and and everything else started going down because. Uh, the, the guys working on site weren't as tired. They were getting proper advice. They were they were being they also felt as though they were being looked after yeah. and that they mattered. Not just you're on the site. This is the job. You're here Sunday night to Friday night, and then you're driving back home. It was they they really put an arm around them, mm -hmm. and that 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 was my I think that was my starting point when I when we looked at that question. Duncan, yeah. I, don't... Uh, I mean I. I... I think mental health crisis is, is is probably a slight misnomer. I think it's more, I think it's mental health enlightenment in that this problem has been there for a long, long time. I think it's rightly getting the attention that, that it needs, but it's not new news. I mean, we've had COVID and we've had lots of triggers for poor mental health, but that's been an issue for, for many, many years. And I think, and I think now, so the psychology is catching up and we're understanding how it impacts people's performance and the choices that they make um, and the energy saving that we're, we're doing. Um, I feel like at this point everyone just should stand up and stand up. <laughs> Mexican wave. Um, it's a collective wave. And, and I think I actually I think you know, for large companies I, I sympathize with large companies I think there's an element of grabbing hold of things and going god we need to do something I'm not sure it's that clear what you, you do do in, in reality. I'm going to come back to the HSC and give them some kudos in a minute. So, you know, you get these initiatives and in mental health first aiders are brilliant. There's a lot of research recently about the impact that mental health first aiders have had on their businesses because like it, like all good meaning things, they've got to be implemented and executed well with data and evidence to back things up. Um, so I think I think that's a, that's a good thing that's happened. What, what I... I think the HSE have done a really good job on this, this whole psychosocial risk of here is your guidance about how you can manage stress. And it, when you read it, it's not that, it's not rocket science. You know, it's like your employees should feel like they're in control of their workload. Your employees should feel like they've got the right tools to do their job. And, and again, they're, they're not, that's not like sort of a silver bullet, really. That's been the case forever. But I think perhaps organizations are now being held more to account. And because of the way we have been economically, which I think is changing a little bit, because employees are more willing now to move um, and go to where they feel like they're valued and where they get the sorts of facilities that you're talking about, Andrew and I, and I was at a, a customer site a few weeks ago and a brand new factory that's not been used yet, and they were showing me the welfare facilities, and they're amazing now compared to what you probably had in a factory 10 years ago, which was probably a, a toilet in the corner in a Pirelli calendar. You know, we've we've moved on a huge amount, but I do think there's still for organizations some quite basic stuff that the HSE gives good guidance on of do these things first rather than, and I'm not picking fault with these things, but rather than a fruit bowl or an EAP thing that people subscribe to, actually engage with 
you've got the right tools to do the job. You've you've got you've got um, a way of speaking to your managers and your leadership team. So in our business, we use objectives and key results. It's, it's trendy because Google did that, but it's a brilliant tool that you can use for the same purpose. So we engage with our employees on this is what we're planning to do. What do you think? How do you think that? What, what tools do we need? Over prioritizing, I think, is a is a huge issue for probably every business and probably particularly law firms and accountancy firms, you know, where you where your knowledge economy businesses, I think stress is, is a massive unquantified challenge for those sorts of companies, as well as the, the construction businesses that, that you've been talking about as well, Andrew. Yeah, I think, yeah, I mean, it's funny you mentioned the sort of stress element. I think, you know, in a, in a law firm, you know, maybe sort of areas like that are not addressed or haven't been historically as well as they as well as they should be um, you know you go to a construction site you can see you can see where problems are initially maybe you come into a business like this you wouldn't necessarily see it straight off um, and I, th I think there's i agree with you in terms of what the hse have done in terms of the, the work around the subject i'm going to throw it open to uh, the people in the room again whether anyone's got any any sort of comments on that area just got a question on health and safety enforcement in the area of psychosocial risk. We've seen some regulators, such as the Australian regulators, been very aggressive in prosecuting health, mental health in the workplace. Normally there's a suicide and there are specific uh, psychosocial risk laws in Australia. I'm just wondering that, that from my perspective, I think the HC is doing a good job, but in a kind of a, a soft campaign kind of way in terms of instigating the Working Minds campaign. Do you envisage that there's going to be any health and safety enforcement in the area of uh, mental health in the workplace in the UK at any time? I think there's definitely the potential for that. I think, as you say, at the moment, it feels like we're going through the stage of educating. Um, and once that period of education is, uh, I mean, the fact that the, H the HSC has identified this as an important area for regulation, that one sort of regulation or advice at the moment. Um, it seems to me that yes, in the future that might be ripe, but but I, I, I suppose I would would be interesting to see what would that look like, um, because if we're if we look at an inquest process, for example, the question the coroner is looking at is how how did that person die, and you're looking at um, you know in a very straightforward inquest, which isn't looking at you know sort of causation factors you're looking at how and if there are circumstances that were occurring in somebody's workplace where they felt um i don't know they were doing the job of two or three different people working very long hours they had they had explained that they couldn't do this and they were feeling this level of pressure um then that you can see could fit within the how the how they died question is a broader question other than the, the the actual way in which somebody took their own life um but i suppose i would ask well where would that how would you translate that into a tangible legal concept that for example a jury could understand that they could be satisfied so that they were sure that the stresses that somebody was under caused their death or there was a risk of that um, so yeah, so I, I think I think yes, in the future, um, that, that certainly is something that we should all be wary of and aware of. And part of this process of the campaign and educating is so that in the way that businesses have the safety structures in place and the policies and the processes and the auditing and the monitoring that something similar should be there for the health because i think andrew is absolutely right we talk about health and safety we just it rolls off our tongues health and safety but we we really rarely focus on the health part of it <laughs> that's the point it is and, and rightly so exactly mm. and i think the safety thing though is it's more in your face it's it's, it's there now rather than the health thing which is you I think it's also something that's historically, and I would hope this is changing generally, is, is something that um, people didn't talk about, so it was less known about. 
And I think it just, you know, comes very much back to Duncan's point about it is about culture and it is about fostering an environment in which people feel that they are able to say that they are suffering, their health, their mental health is suffering. And being able to say that is not going to affect their chances of progression within the business, for example, or, or being given responsibility. So it is, it is that balance that I think businesses have got to look as to how we can achieve that. Comes back to where we started this morning about this does cost, of course. Um, but again, um, I do think it's important to put costs and monies into, you know, if we've got, we've got a happy workforce, um, you know, then that's going to be perhaps a more productive work workforce and a workforce that you can retain, people will retain, stay in a business for longer. So it's perhaps more cost effective than retraining and bringing in new people. But you will all know that better than I do. And there's loads of research on that. You, you know, it's not, it, and it's intuitively and scientifically clear that happy people work better. Happy people give you more ideas. I love that idea of work as done versus work as imagined in that you've got your employees at the front line of your service delivery who are far better to tell you how to make improvements you know, and far better place to innovate than at the board often because the board in large businesses are a long way away from where the action happens. Yeah. So if, you, if you're harnessing all that, all that IP, it's it's very obviously going to benefit the business and it is and as a, as an ex accountant it is a slight bugbear that you look at the balance sheets of these businesses which are full of machinery and equipment and not a single human being and yet your human capital is a is a competitive differentiator and a massive part of your asset in in an organization but but it's not on the balance sheet which to some extent perhaps means which is perhaps why we are where we are which is that therefore it's not measured it's not tracked you don't maintain it in the way that you know that you need to maintain your machinery to keep that on your balance sheet. So I think I think there's a shift there for people to be human beings, to be seen as human capital and valued as such. But it's hard because the, the way that we account for things isn't isn't structured around that. I think also we want to mention there's certain elements of health that is um, mandatory. When we talk about occupational health, for instance, now, we can talk about mental health, but there's a lot of elements of health within the workplace that's currently enforced by the HSC, such as vibration, noise, dermatitis, um, certain elements there that are enforced. Stress, you mentioned stress. Well, that's enforced to a degree in regards to stress management and stress assessments. So I think there is a lot of element of health that is enforced. But obviously, when we come on to mental health, again, I think that could be enforced to a degree through the civil courts as well, couldn't it? You know, it's a lot easier to kind of justify something through the civil courts than it is through the criminal courts <coughs> um, in relation to any liability that's on a business or an individual in regards to not looking after somebody's mental health. Yeah, it's, yeah, I mean, I, I sort of, you know, the health element you're right there is, there is a lot there you know the vibration stuff you talk about you know the right finger the detectors that went on the machines to, to deal with that i still think you know my my personal view is i still don't think in a lot of industries that there's those conversations going on sort of generally they might be on specific subjects but not not generally throughout the workforce i think it's getting a lot better and, and that's great because that that helps the that helps the employees and it helps the business and like you said mm -hmm. the the human capital within that business. Um, I'm just going to I'm going to move on to the, the subject of technology. Um, I I sort of um, we've got a couple of areas to get through and um, and one of them's uh, technology. Um, in in terms of you know we we live in a in a society we we rely more and more on technology. How do you think that the role of technology can help with regards to um, sort of managing developing health and safety uh, practices within the business, especially during an economic um, downturn? And and does it you know is there is there a positive there? Is it, you know I, I suppose that's my question. Which one of you would like to? Well, I think it's a question for Duncan. Really. <laughs> <laughs> Duncan, I'll start with it. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll start with it. Well, I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm, my answer would be would be absolutely technology can help. Um, 
actually to, to one easy point that Saba raised earlier about your just documenting what's going on in the organization I'm still surprised today at the number of companies that do things on paper I mean it's 2023 um, and obviously I've been in technology my, my career so I, I, I'm probably ahead of a curve but it still astonishes me the number of businesses that run on that and these are successful businesses but oh, there's there's a really easy use case in terms of technology just around automation um, having things in the right place you look at an investigation I guess where you guys come involved and you know if you've got bits of paper all over the place and an email here and a phone call there that, that's hours of time and you talked about management time earlier Andrew it's it's somebody's time to go and try and pull that all together if you've got a digital system you've got everything ideally in one place and we, we, we I see a lot of that and that's a lot of reasons that, that companies come to to notify I think at a deeper level the demographic is changing obviously quite rapidly in terms of the number of people in work of certain ages and their appetite for digital so I think now an organization that when a when a new starter turns up at 20 something years of age and they're given a a folder with the health and safety policies and the forms in it they're just not going to engage they'd be like I only work on an app so can I have it on an app please and you know so you've I think I think because of the the culture point and the engagement point you you need to engage with people at where they are and that's been what we've learned in lockdown right you you had you had people overnight being sent back from their offices in the thousands to work at home and the technology pretty much worked bizarrely for, for most people that there were challenges later down the line but now when people are dispersed you know where risk is I often think where the risk is in an organization is not at the desktop computer in a nice office it's where the person is next to a railway line or a pylon or you know by a tunnel that they're building and so you need to be able to allow them to connect back to base and actually if you do that if you give people the tools that they can use there and then firstly you'll find out more that's going on so you know if, if it's a paper form that you need to go and fill in back at the office when you get back what is the likelihood you're going to do it if it's something that's digital and easy to do whether it's scanning a qr code or going on a mobile device you're more likely to do it and we see that massively but what the technology then allows you to do which i think is really neat is it allows feedback to come back to that individual through the technology to say thank you for logging that near miss thank you for making that report and time and again what you hear it'd be interesting to if this is what you guys come up when you're investigating but time and again you hear people saying i don't report anything because nothing ever happens so so we didn't tell them that this stuff was a problem you know this engine was was having problems for weeks months years until something bad happened because the last time i reported or the five times i reported it nobody knows with a digital audit trail of this stuff, it's so much easier for your people to feel connected. It's back to that work as done versus work as imagined for me, which is you've got your board up here and then you've got your, your workforce. Technology tools allow you to connect the two. Um, so that, that would be one thing. And then the data for me is, is the key part of what you can then drive. So we talked about, you know, the, the, the health side, the well-being. But, but actually, and the influencing of the safety professionals of the board to keep investing in safety. If you collate that data, you have a far more, a far stronger position to reinforce the value of investing in safety. You have a much bigger opportunity to spot the, um, the opportunities that you could make within your business, which are not just safety related because people's ideas come out of near misreporting and so on. So I think that, that connecting the workforce which they're already doing because they're on Teams or Zoom anyway. I think that's been a huge benefit that we've seen from companies trying to go digital. But like I say, it's still, um, when we raised our funding uh, five years ago, we had a lovely, uh, a lovely technology roadmap where by now we'd all be AI led and internet of things would be everywhere. And then I meet a massive company and they're saying, we're doing it on paper. We thought we'd get an app and you're like, okay, well, that's where we were you know, five years ago, but we're happy to do that. So I think companies are at so many different stages that at that beginning level, we're still seeing organizations grapple with, I guess we call digital transformation, which is a, and unfortunately that's another cost for the companies to bear. Um, I was gonna say, I think the two points I'd make on that is first, I, I it resonates so much with me when you say there's bits of papers here and there because, you know, a kind of investigation comes to me. I write my shopping list of everything that I would like to Andrew. 
and Andrew, it, you know, is passes it on and actually we're only able to produce half the training records. So now we've got a problem with the training allegation. Um, we can't show, um, you, know, you know, there'll be various of the gaps that everyone says, well, no, we, we, we will definitely have done it. And so, but the point is you haven't got the documentation to support that because it's been lost somewhere. <coughs> or there's been a flood or it's buried away somewhere or so and so has left there who knew where it was and it's or it's found under a box in someone's desk in a storeroom um and that that i can tell you is such a massive frustration because unless you the organizations give us the tools um to defend you um you know we we feel very much hampered at the other end what i would say about technology also is that there can be criticism of overuse, and Duncan probably won't like what I'm about to say, but I'm going to say it. Um, so, for example, um, training systems which are just a quick tick, 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 tick as you go through are, are meaningless because then, you know, you've got a, a young person being trained who's just sitting there and just ticking. And then everything that they've ticked, exactly the opposite happens and a horrible ha accident happens. So I think there has got to be a balance between, or, or it's not balance actually, what it is, is you've got to have the right technology. So it's technology that's asking the questions if it's used for training in a way in which somebody's got to do the proper thinking about it and not just tick a box that allows re retraining and refresher training, um, but captures that information and captures any gaps in that information and captures responses to that those gaps and ensuring that they are complied with um, so for me it's, you know technology is can be brilliant but it can also actually come back to really bite you later on if it's not utilized appropriately and i, I don't think that's controversial to me i mean I, I i and that's partly why we would lead with culture and and what you what you start with because if you have a ceo who quite evidently doesn't believe in it to her or his leadership team no technology in the world is going to address that and and hide that problem because technology is only a tool you know it's, it's a much more efficient tool perhaps than the old tools which is excel or pen and paper or whatever but yeah i completely agree and and i i i know that um, perhaps with certain generation there is an element of well technology can fix everything but we see time and again that it that it doesn't fix without a human element controlling it. We're not going to AI and chat GPT just yet, but you, you know that that is that is some of the challenge that we face, I think, with with tech. So I'm I'm not offended. Definitely not offended. Um, Another challenge I've seen with clients is where uh, the employer has moved data slides. Right. They've gone from you know, a sage to something else, and the historical data has been lost. Or not properly archived, yeah. and that creates a problem. So, having the right type of uh, digital resource, I think, is really, really important. And then going back to what you were saying about um, the use of the digital tools, um, how how do you use your your tools in, in Notify to address issues such as uh, you know, hidden disabilities and uh, health, mental health issues. Because I, I, I can imagine in a training environment, it's actually kind of quite difficult to convey that to another employee about looking out for somebody else's mental health um, as well as their own. But I'd be interested to hear how you go about addressing yeah, um, mental health issues within a digital context. I, I think that um, I think mental health with technology is is phenomenally hard and i've had this discussion quite a number of times around in my in my ideal world it would be lovely to think that it's the same scenario when i see a a near miss happen i can report that when i see a when i see a colleague's worried or anxious or i feel very negative thoughts therefore i could do the same thing but I don't I think we'd be kidding ourselves to think that people are at that place just yet. So so when we work with clients, typically what we are giving them is the tool set. So in Notify, you can customize what you want to report on and track and analyze. So if a client wants to 
use it for that kind of reporting for hidden disabilities or mental health reporting. They can, and we support them in doing it, but we we don't advertise it as you will you will crack your your mental health challenges through this. Like we don't say you'll crack safety through it. We say this is a tool to help you automate or engage. But I think it's a really interesting um, topic that we're probably not going to have time to cover. But yeah, and maybe we ca catch up after because you're into then people with wearable devices. And do you start tracking somebody's heart rate during the day to see when they are anxious? <laughs> nobody, <laughs> nobody wants that. And in Germany, that's totally illegal. You know. <laughs> General data protection that people's personal information, yeah. whether they, they, they want to freely give that over to people to actually look at, and monitor, and actually uh, act upon. Yes, yeah. I'm, I'm sort of conscious of the time, and the, the, there's one we, we've got a few more minutes left. And the, there was one area I wanted to cover, and I'm not going to comment on technology because I'm sat here with my with my neighbour. The lights that this <laughs> the lights don't work. I know, it's, um, but. I think I think the one area I wanted to sort of m maybe finish on um, is where you have a senior leadership team within a business. Um, from from both of your viewpoints, how do you think you get the best engagement with that senior leadership team from a health and safety perspective, and make sure that health and safety is it's on the agenda, it's being discussed, it's being budgeted for. I think you tell them the top three prosecution sentences in their area. So I'm, I'm, I'm saying that, but um, um, I actually think that count that that is part of it. I don't think starting the way Duncan says, starting with scaremongering, is necessarily the right way. I think education is is the way to start really. Into I think there has to be you've got to have a senior leadership team who recognise the importance of health and safety. Of keeping their uh, of keeping their from a human perspective of keeping their workforce, um, it's a dual approach, isn't it? It's it's what what are my responsibilities to my my employees? It's to keep them safe and well. Um, and if I don't do that, what are the potential consequences of that? Um, so I I joke when I say top three prosecutions, but it is I think it is a dual aspect, and I think um, from a it, it's individual, isn't it? You've got to tailor it to the to the nature of the individual and that particular board. I, I've got a client who of a large organisation that always says, um, because inevitably in the size of their organisation, things do happen that go wrong. And they will always say, um, we'll just take what's coming. And actually, the, the director that always comes to court with me says, I hope we get a really big fine this time, because then the message will really go to the board. Because most of the time when I go back, um, it's not down to me, it's, you know, it's team effort circumstances. I go back, they say, well done, well done. Um, it's been managed. Yes. So I think, I think it is for those of you that have to do that, have that uncomfortable, difficult conversation because you are, <laughs> have the safety responsibility in the business. Um, it's, it's tailoring it, but focusing on those, those two aspects. <laughs> I mean, it's probably the same. It's influencing and understanding how you, to influence how you influence them. So, um, I, I totally agree. Some, uh, generally speaking, I think most boards are influenced by facts and data and, and the science. So the fact is, these people have been fined, and this has been very uncomfortable for the CEO. That will resonate with some CEOs. Being able to say we we've, we've <laughs> Um, seen a reduction in our accident rate or LTI because of some initiatives we rolled out in the year, where it becomes crystal clear that the evidence is backing up the, the program or the safety strategy it is, is powerful, even, even for the hardest nosed of, of boards. And then I think there's a bit of what investors and shareholders do, because they ultimately can influence what, what, what organisations do. And, and they need to be asking their, their companies who on your board is making this happen? You know, who's got who's got responsibility and lives and breathes this stuff rather than a we have a board meeting, we tick a box to say, yes, we've talked about health and safety. And I think that 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 that's a drive that we're seeing, but it's a drive that I think we, we need to see more of. Yeah, I, I, I think that's right. I think the the drivers from you know 
shareholders, investors, that, that that's becoming more important. I simply say, if you get things right, you spend less time with me. That's a, that, that's a, that's a positive. <laughs> win. <laughs> and we're, we're, we're sort of out of time, really. Um, uh, those, those of you that have been listening online, as I said at the start, if you'd like to uh, put a um, put a question in the comments box, we'll, we'll come back to you uh, at some point um, and, and try and answer those questions. Uh, those of you in the room, um, there will be some drinks so we can carry on discussions, uh, which would be great. Um, thank you to everyone for coming. Uh, more importantly, I'd like to say thank you to Saba and thank you for Duncan for giving up their time uh, to come here today. It's been much appreciated. Um, I'm going to do two plugs for Phil Fisher. One, we have a, another health and safety roundtable event on the 5th of May, um, which is about investigations, what to do, what not to do. And also, we've got our very first podcast uh, on health and safety coming out, which is which, which A, involves me, but, but please don't let that put you off. Um, it's really interesting with a, uh, with, with a couple of guys from industry who sort of talk about it from their uh, perspective. But um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, please feel free to join us for a drink. And those of you online, thank you ever so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you, Andrew.